Hey, Health Fix Junkies, it's Dr. Anna Marie from the Happy Whole You podcast. It's a podcast where I talk about all things brain health, mindset, and holistic wellness. Check out episode 454 on the Health Fix podcast, where I talk about how to transform your biology by changing how you think. You're listening to the Health Fix podcast with your host, Dr. Janine Krauss. Hey, Health Junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix podcast, I'm interviewing Ashok Gupta. He suffered from chronic fatigue syndrome 30 years ago while at Cambridge University. And through his own neurological research, he was able to recover 100%. Since 2007, he's been teaching others on neuroplasticity and limbic training in his program called the Gupta Program. Today, we're going to be talking about his theory when it comes to chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, mold toxicity, multiple chemical sensitivities, and more. Here's the thing. His theory is exactly what I've suspected over the years. So when I saw his information, I was like, okay, yes, you have to be on the podcast. So many of the hard to treat chronic illnesses are triggered by a long period of stress then something infecting or agitating the immune system starts to create a cycle where the immune system keeps fighting, telling the nervous system there's still danger. And now, eventually, any exposure to a bug, allergen, toxin, and boom, the cycle of illness repeats or flares up. If this sounds like you, or you know someone dealing with this type of situation, please share this podcast with them because this information is so important. It can save you time, money, grief from multiple protocols that don't work. I can tell you that in my own personal experience. So let's introduce you to Asha Gupta and his Gupta program. Hey, Health Junkies, I have Asha Gupta on with me today, and we're going to be talking about something that I love to talk about because brain retraining and really trying to understand what is going on with chronic illness when no one else can figure it out is is definitely my jam and definitely something I want folks to have access to. So we're going to talk about the Gupta program. We're going to talk about what Ashok's up to with his crew and all of that today. So Ashok, welcome to the Health Fix podcast. Thank you, Janine. Thank you for the invitation. And it's uh, lovely to be here. Well, I've been excited about this podcast because I'm always on the hunt for helping folks to overcome conditions when it seems that nothing else is working. We can't find answers. And and in looking through your your process, I thought, gosh, you know, a lot of this makes sense. And a lot of it really kind of hits hits home for me in terms of how I see a lot of chronic illness presenting in folks. So before we go there, though, you have your own story of being chronically fatigued, you know, just just not doing so well 25 years ago or so. So I would love to hear kind of how it presented for you and what you did to kind of get to the point to create the Gupta program. And then we'll talk all about what it's all about. Thank you, Janine. Yes. So like many of us, you've come into this field it's often been as a result of our own challenges our own health challenges that we've faced so i remember gosh this was 20, almost 30 years ago now almost 30 wow. years ago i was studying as an undergrad at cambridge uh, in the mid 90s and i got some kind of bug some kind of stomach bug felt fluey and the stomach bug kind of went away but it left a legacy where suddenly i felt worse and worse and worse physically so it was where the worst moments were I had to crawl to the bathroom. I couldn't read words on a page. I was exhausted all the time. I slept 12 hours a night, but just felt exhausted. And I thought there must be something seriously wrong here. So I'd go from doctor to doctor and they would say, look, we don't know what causes this. We don't know what to call it. We don't know what we really have. We don't have any treatments for it. And you might have it for the rest of your life. Goodbye. There's nothing we can do. And you can imagine for a young man, that was like almost like a death sentence. Say, so, right, there's nothing we can do about this illness. And, and I met so many other hundreds of people who were suffering from this. And, you know, in my worst moments, I just made this contract with the universe. I said, if I can just get myself well, I will dedicate the rest of my life to helping others with this condition because there is untold suffering out there 
of millions, if not tens of millions of people who have these unknown diseases. And their quality of life, they say, is at the latter st- equivalent to the latter stages of cancer in mm-hmm. terms of how it affects them. And yet no one seems to be really focusing the research. And so I then read brain neurology, uh, physiology, and I came across some really interesting work by someone called Professor Joseph Ledoux, who was one of the foremost neuroscientists in the mid-90s. And I formulated a hypothesis as to what might be causing this in my brain. And I essentially retrained my brain in a very ad hoc way, because in the mid-90s, I mean, these diseases weren't recognized at all often. And I managed to get myself 100% well. And then I published a medical hypothesis, which was published online in 99 and then in a journal in 2002 and then went on to set up a clinic to treat others. And then obviously we have the the app and all the medical uh, studies that we've done. So it's been a real journey over the last 25 years. And like many of us on this journey, at the time it felt absolutely awful. But I realized for me, it was a blessing because it completely changed who I was, who I choose to become and the work that I'm now able to do. So yeah, it's been a real journey. Oh my goodness. I, I can imagine, right? I Having been a doc almost 20 years now, you know, I've seen a lot of folks walk this walk and have been frustrated for them, you know, looking at different things. And and really, it's it's heartbreaking because you see people spending so much money trying, you know, medication after medication, protocol after protocol and supplements like crazy, of course, because I'm a naturopath. That's kind of, you know, where a lot of people come to me in, in that department and really, you know, what you have as as your article here looking at the brain and looking at the immune system so kind of the neuroimmunological response if you will is something that i've kind of come down to and i think i think folks are starting to become aware because covid long haul kind of got the conventional medicine world to realize that viruses can cause long term symptoms like the the um Oh my gosh, brain is going, of course, right now. The the things like the long haul of even mono and things of that mm-hmm. nature as a whole. Mm-hmm. But but what I see a lot in my practice, maybe because it's in the Pacific Northwest and it's a little more damp, is the mold and mm-hmm. and the mold coming up and over again. Um, and any little exposure pops off more. And that was the one thing that that really your video caught me. It was like, yeah, you know, we have this initial exposure, kind of like your gut. And then things pop off from there. So explain to folks who are listening a little bit of how you were thinking like, okay, I've got this gut bug. Then my nerve, my my immune system reacted to this gut bug. And then my nervous system reacted as well. So give us a scoop of how the, how a bug could cause the brain to go off the rails. Yeah, it's a fascination, isn't it? Like this is the, the curiosity. There's a, there's a geek side of me that says, well, I want to understand this. What on earth is going on? And it is a mystery where we've got different jigsaw pieces, but we don't know how they fit together. Mm-hmm. And in the mid nineties, I just had to take that leap of faith to say, okay, let's arrange the jigsaw pieces like this. And this could be a way, this could be a picture that we could build up. And I know exactly what you're saying because I meet naturopaths, nutritionists, you know, every day, in fact, who are recommending our program in conjunction with the work they're doing. And they say to me, you know, it's so frustrating because we do some great work with clients and we get them a certain stage. But as soon as they have a stress in their lives or an infection or something, wham, all the symptoms come back and we continue with the same protocols, but it doesn't seem to change. So then we have to introduce a new protocol. And don't get me wrong, sometimes people do go on to heal and they they have their lives back and that's great, but sometimes they don't. And it's such a mystery to understand what's going on. So if I can paint a picture of this whole hypothesis as to what I believe uh, causes these conditions. So the starting point for all of this is, for me, it has to make logical sense scientifically as to why these diseases come. Mm -hmm. So we ask the first question of all, the ultimate question, in fact, why are we here? (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Now, I'd love to have a philosophical discussion with you, Janine, about this, but let's focus on the the science for the moment. So we're here because over millions of years of evolution, this nervous system, this immune system has evolved over millions of years, tens of millions of years, in fact. So from, um, you know, plant life, single cell organisms, invertebrates, vertebrates, reptiles, mammals, human beings, we have evolved along that charter and many people don't realize that we actually contain the dna of all those previous animals so our dna contains 40 percent of the same dna as a banana 
which I find really fascinating. So we really yeah. literally are at one with nature because we've come along that evolutionary trail to get to where we are. And so therefore, the number one priority of the brain and our nervous system, and our immune system, is to survive, adapt to our environment to ensure survival, procreate, and pass on our genes to the next generation. So that's our first jigsaw piece in this puzzle, that the brain doesn't care whether you're well, whether you're reacting to mold or anything like that. What it cares about is, are you surviving? That's the number one priority. So that gives us a little clue to these different conditions. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is, let's take the example of COVID, because we all know somebody who's got long COVID, who's still suffering the after effects of that, yeah. right? So imagine COVID comes along and our nervous system and our immune system are on standby mode. And then suddenly in comes in what we call in medical terms an insult. So we get this virus coming in. And normally our immune system and nervous system is activated. The nervous system being the electrical system of our brain and our nervous system through our body. It's almost like the information system that tells the body what to do. And then we have our immune system, which is obviously, you know, as we know, the, the part that protects our body from these invaders. And imagine that normally we fight it off. We fight off the virus and our body comes back to standby. But imagine for whatever reason, the brain decides that after we fought off the COVID infection, it errs on the side of caution to say, I'm not sure if we fought off that virus completely. Maybe it's still around. Mm -hmm. And this is equivalent to how war veterans become traumatized in a state of war. Yeah? Even though they come back to civilian life, they still react as if the war is on to the slightest trigger. Yeah? And to, a way to kind of describe this is, let's take, I, let's, I don't know if you're a Game of Thrones fan by any chance, Janine. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not, but I've heard enough about it, so I, I can follow. Enough about it. <laughs> so let's take the example of a fairy tale. So let's imagine, Janine, that you are Queen Janine. Well, that has a, a rhythmic ring to it. Queen Janine yes. of your kingdom. And imagine that your kingdom is essentially your body. And you are the prefrontal cortex. So you're the rational conscious mind that you know, is the master of this body, this kingdom. And your army is your nervous system and your navy is your immune system that defends this kingdom and this castle against invaders, rival armies. Okay. Now, normally an army comes over the hill, army and navy fight it off, your immune system and nervous system, your system comes back to balance. But imagine you've had a drought in the kingdom. So now the kingdom is weaker, the army and navy are weaker than they normally are. And Janine, I don't know if you notice this in your practice, but we certainly noticed that people who are more prone to getting these conditions, uh, like ME-CFS, fibromyalgia, mold, they tend to have some increased stresses in the one year to six months in the run-up to getting the conditioning event. Yeah. Yeah. So in this case, that's the idea of the drought in the kingdom. It's a little weaker than normal. So now the virus comes over the hill and the army and navy are galvanized, they fight it off but they take longer to fight it off because they're in a weakened state. And we know from the field of psychoneuroimmunology that our immune system is weaker when we're more stressed. And people think, Ashok, are you saying it's emotional stress? And I say, no, it's not just emotional stress. It can be physical stress. It can be biological stress. If you've had a whole run of infections or had a, you know, a, an operation or something, any kind of physical, emotional stress that comes into your body, mental stress, can impact on its ability to handle another virus. And so now what happens, the generals come to their weekly meeting with Queen Janine and they say, Queen Janine, we're not sure if the rival army is fully defeated. They might be hiding in the forests. So we need all the resources now of the kingdom. So we need the, the metal, the wheat, the corn, the water supply. Forget the population in the kingdom, we need that because if we don't survive, defending this kingdom, the whole kingdom will fall and everyone will die. So you think as the queen, that makes logical sense. Okay, you get the resources. So now the army and navy keep fighting off their weapons of war, keep firing it off at, to the invaders who might be hiding in the, in the jungle. But what happens is some of those arrows fall back into the kingdom accidentally. That's where we get the inflammatory effects in the body, the inflammation of the body. We get the weakening of the gut. We get the, um, autoimmune effects. Yep. So some of those arrows falling back in, that's the triggering of the immune system. And not only that, then the spies in the kingdom, who normally the secret service look after and get rid of the spies, 
they start proliferating. So now you've got opportunistic viruses, opportunistic infections that start proliferating in the kingdom, sensitivities, etc., etc. And this system, the weaker and weaker the kingdom gets, the army and navy generals keep coming to you each week and saying, we need more resources, we need more resources, we need to defend the kingdom. And the way this works in neuroimmune conditions like long COVID, fibromyalgia, ME, chronic fatigue syndrome, is that the weaker and weaker that the kingdom becomes and the more and more arrows fall into the kingdom, the more and more the army and navy keep firing off their weapons of war at the slightest provocation. And the symptoms themselves, the physical symptoms in the body, become the trigger to the brain that we might still be in danger, triggering the immune system and nervous system, causing the symptoms in the body, which will loop back to a hypersensitive brain, round and around we go. And that's when we go from an acute phase of condition to an a chronic disease state. Yeah, because logically, there must be a feedback loop, which is keeping someone in a state of illness. And in the case of, let's say, pain syndromes, similar thing, the pain networks of the system become hypersensitized. So even though there's no external thing causing the pain anymore, our pain networks get sensitized, our anxiety networks get sensitized, and now those pain signals keep coming into the brain, even though there's no obvious logical reason for the pain, but that then means that we send more inflammation to the, that part of the body with the pain, which causes the pain, and so on and so on. And finally, the mold that you talked about. This is very interesting. So we treat not only mold illness, but chemical sensitivities, mm -hmm. electrical sensitivities, and, and many other food sensitivities and allergies. And what we notice is that in this scenario, the army were absolutely right to defend the kingdom. So when there was a mold exposure at some point in someone's life, when they were really stressed, the army and navy reacted to that mold exposure. And that may have been a semi-threatening level of exposure. But once the system is conditioned, that means it's learned to react, then compared to, let's say the first time was 100% exposure, now 5% exposure is enough to trigger the defensive response. And therefore, someone might go into a house that they never reacted to before, but suddenly now they're reacting to the mold, even though their other family members are not reacting, because their brain has learned to hyper defend them. Yeah? And then you can see the whole system, this, it gets into a state of chronic illness. And you can certainly have a nutrients, you can have supplements, you can have changes in diet, and they can impact. And suddenly they may persuade the system that we're safe and the army and navy may go back to normal. But another provocation comes along, guess what? They over respond and react. And brain retraining is that next meeting that you have with your army generals. You say to them, my dear generals, you have done a wonderful job in protecting the body, but the war is over. Stand down. <laughs> we are no longer under threat. And then what happens is the army and navy, if they can be persuaded, and that's the purpose of neuroplasticity is a repetition, if they can be persuaded that we are no longer in danger, no longer in the same position as we were when the illness first came along, then they will stand down and the body comes back to homeostasis. And that's what we do in brain retraining is persuade the system to do that through neuroplasticity. So in a nutshell, that is the hypothesis. Yeah. It makes perfect sense to me. It's like the the body has PTSD from the virus, the mold, the chemical, the the whatever it may be, and it just goes on hyper alert. And mm -hmm. and I you know I see this all the time, kind of like you had described. You know the the army kicks itself up again. You know each time there's there's some threats, and so you know as a doc being frustrated because you know here I am trying to okay, now what do we do? How do we change the protocol? How do we, you know, how do we mop up the mold toxins? You know, how do we, you know, whatever it may be, how do we get the virus out? Um, and, and obviously I've learned that overkilling viruses and things of that nature doesn't work. Um, we need to, we need to go back to, to the brain and the inflammation response. So tell us a little bit about the amygdala, the insula, like the, mm -hmm. the actual brain workings here. So folks can kind of get an idea of like, okay, what is actually happening deep in the brain and how are you are you using neuroplasticity to work on those specific areas what are you guys doing in in the gupta program like what would people be doing as their their biofeedback trainings sure so often people think that 
when we talk about the amygdala and insula, that these brain structures are operating in isolation. Yeah. But of course, the brain is this massive interconnected network of different structures that are constantly communicating with each other. And not only that, they're constantly communicating, communicating through the body. That's why with the vagus nerve, so the vagus nerve is one of the primary communication points for upward and downward information flows. And we hear a lot about the vagus nerve recently. And so the brain structures that are involved include the amygdala, the insula, but also the, the prefrontal cortex. We talked about the rational mind, you, your subjective experience of being you is kind of stored up here. And then we talk about the anterior cingulate. So, so many different brain structures are involved. The amygdala and insula, if we talk about those two for a moment, the amygdala, there's two round almond shaped structures that sit behind the eyes. And their role is to take in incoming data, incoming sensory data, and judge it as to whether it's threat worthy or emotion worthy. And remember, our emotions are essentially reactions to our environment to help us to keep safe. So even anger or fear or guilt, they're all emotions to keep us safe. And so the brain is constantly monitoring that and the emotions are often processed within the amygdala in our unconscious. That's these unconscious fear receptors. And those brain structures, that's where we believe that some of the nervous system conditioning is stored. And that has been shown in some animal studies. And that's where we believe the nervous system starts learning to over respond. And when we talk about PTSD, anxiety conditions, they're often located or have been certainly shown to be primarily located in the amygdala. Hmm. Secondly, the insular part of the brain. Now, this is a different structure. It sits between the limbic system and the cortex. And there have been other programs out there and other processes that have started calling this limbic retraining, whereas actually that's inaccurate because the insula doesn't sit in the limbic part of the brain. It actually sits, it's actually the core part of the cortex. And that part of the brain is designed to take in all incoming data from our body, whether it's immune data, nervous system data, physiological data, heart rate, process it, decide whether we're under threat and create the appropriate immune and nervous system response. And this you're going to find really fascinating, Judy. So some research um, that was conducted you know, many years ago, because we always, we always hypothesized it was the insula. Um, some research showed that actually when they gave rats sweet water combined with an immunosuppressant, those rats' immune systems got suppressed, which is what we would expect. They repeated that process five times. And what they found was they could give those rats sweet water without the immunosuppressant. And guess what happened? The rat's immune system was suppressed. So that's what we call neurological learning in the brain. That's neuroplasticity, where the brain is making a connection, saying, well, when we have immune, when we have this immunosuppressant combined with sweet water, maybe it's the sweet water that's giving us the instruction to ratchet down the immune system. And when they dissect the brains, they find that it's stored primarily in the insular part of the brain and supported by the amygdala. And this is something we hypothesized 15 years ago, and it's now modern research is showing that this is true. And some recent research by Dr. Asia Rolls in Israel, and this is absolutely fascinating. They took rats and they created inflammatory bowel disease in these rats by giving them an agitator in their gut yeah, that inflamed the bowel. And they measured the electrical signature in the brain, specifically in the insula. Then they brought these rats back to baseline and they triggered that same electrical signature in the brain, just in the insular part of the brain. And guess what? They were able to create inflammatory bowel disease in exactly the same way, just by triggering that one part of the brain. Wow. And it's the first time in modern science that we've learned that peripheral immune responses, so things that happen in our bodies, that information flows back to our brain and gets stored centrally in our insula, ready for the next response, which then makes sense that if we've responded to a virus, a bacteria, mold, electrical circuits, our system learns that response in the insula, ready for the next time that it occurs. Because the brain's efficient, it wants to help us survive. So it thinks, well, if that was a threat the first time and we only just overcame that threat, then we must respond fivefold, tenfold, every time that threat, even a small amount of that threat comes forward. And that's when we get neurological conditioning. The brain is now conditioned to over respond to even small levels of that threat and we believe this explanation also works for allergies and food sensitivities that at one point in time let's say i'm trying to think a good example we get food poisoning from something mm -hmm. 
right? And it's from a specific type of food. So the brain learns, look, this food makes me ill, it's dangerous. So then the, the gut learns that sensitivity. So the next time you have that food, it has a massive response because it's trying to warn you that this food is dangerous. Mm -hmm. But of course, that food wasn't dangerous. It was just the, the situation. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And also wheat and dairy, which are the two most common uh, sensitivities, they're just things, foods which are generally the population is sensitive to because they're hard to digest. And therefore, most people when they get these types of illnesses will go on to having these kind of wheat and dairy type allergies, egg type allergies. And so that makes sense as well. So I believe that this hypothesis also applies to those conditions uh, as well. Hey, Hell Junkies, wanted to tell you about my pal, Dr. Anna Marie Frank's supplement line that specifically targets the needs of women. From anxiety to depression to getting focused and balancing those hormones, as well as helping with sleep, she's got you covered. Plus, she has teas too. This day and age, it's hard to know what supplement companies are up to when it comes to sourcing and quality. That's why I love to get to know company owners. Dr. Anna Marie has created formulas that combine what I would do if I owned a supplement and tea company. So wanted to tell you about them. As a listener of the Health Fix podcast, you can get 10% off your order by using the code D-R-J-K-R-A-U-S-E when you head to happywholeyou.com. Now, say you're driving or out on an adventure and you're not going to remember where to find this website. That's okay. My favorite products are all on my website at drjkrausnd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find everything I stand behind and use myself right there. So let's get back to the podcast. So in terms of how the Gupta program works, it is essentially a home study course. It's an app and people go through the videos, the audios. And there's weekly webinars with myself where we teach patients how to recognize these unconscious signals. And it's very clear, it's very different to CBT or any kind of cognitive work. This is brain retraining, more equivalent to, let's say when you're rehabilitating after a stroke and you need to create new neuronal connections with parts of your body. In a similar way, we're training the brain that we are no longer in danger and it can ratchet down these responses. And, uh, Thing that, something that's been a game changer, and I'm sure Janine, you see this in your clinic, is what we call daily Gupta size. So these are daily Zoom calls that our clients come on to, which have the nervous system regulation and the brain retraining. And that has been a game changer because many patients are isolated. They feel slightly anxious or depressed. They don't know how they're gonna feel each day, but knowing you can come onto a Zoom call and we take care of you and take you through all the exercises means it just is, ratcheting up people's recoveries, which has been fantastic. So yeah, that's been a, a great support. So yeah, it's a home study course, weekly webinars, and we have 20 to 30 trained coaches around the world where people can have one-on-one -on -one sessions as well. Yeah. And multiple languages I hear is, is what you have too. Yeah. That's right. So we've been translated into Spanish, German, Finnish, uh, and we are going to be, and French is coming soon and Italian is coming soon as well. Cool. Cool. So I have a question for you, just, just something that came to mind and, and something I, you know, hypothesize in my head, because let's face it, a lot of us have a lot of information that comes in about organic food, eating clean, you know, environmental toxins. Do you think that at some point that even your worry about all of those things creates a little bit of, of what I'm going to call a PTSD, you know, danger response within the brain. Do you think that, the, have you seen that connection? Because I know when a lot of people start to get, want to, to improve their health, they start to get really worried about, oh my gosh, I didn't eat something organic. Or what about, you know, my environmental exposures, my EMF exposures? Do you feel like that has an impact and can, can also create issues? It's, just, it's such an interesting question and a very complex answer to a, to a simple question, which is that imagine the brain, the body, our whole system is like a bucket mm -hmm. and it can handle a certain amount of stress. And that stress is physical, mental, emotional, and dare I say it, spiritual in terms mm -hmm. of the amount of stress we can handle. So if we are eating lots of inorganic food with lots of toxins in it, that's a certain amount of stress that comes in the bucket, but our system can, can just about handle it. But then if we're pouring a lot of emotional stress in there, a lot of worry in there, a lot of infections that we're suddenly exposed to, 
whatever it is, the more and more we put in there, eventually the water starts hitting the limit at the top of the bucket and starts flowing over. And that's when we get illness, when our system can no longer have the capacity to handle uh, the amount of stress that's coming in. Uh, there's a special uh, word for it, it skips me now, but that is where, yes, if we worry too much about our food and our environment, that's just an added stress into the system that can make things worse. Having said that, it doesn't mean that those things aren't true either. So it's a both and answer to that. So yes, we should look at eating as clean a diet as possible and taking the right supplements. But if people become obsessive by that, especially food exclusion, you're just putting so much more stress in. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. I find it so funny, right? So some of my clients will be like, oh gosh, yes, I'm feeling worse today because I didn't have my chia seeds. So I didn't get my omegas and I didn't get this. And now I'm feeling worse. And, and I say to them, you know, look at the stress you're taking your system through. Oh, you had a slight, tiny, tiny bit of bread. Oh, now your system's reacting. All the stress and anxiety is triggering your nervous system to make it more likely that your gut is going to go into dysbiosis and can't handle all of these different foods. But also, I know people who eat junk food, they smoke, they drink, and they've got bags of energy, right? And they don't have any gut issues or generally. And you think, how is that possible? What is the difference there? And it comes down to that sensitivity in our nervous system. And we make it more sensitive the more that we worry and obsess about these types of things. And I'll give you another example. Like I know if I'm working hard in my clinic, I've got a busy clinic, I'm seeing lots of people and I'm uh, running everything. I have to be careful with my diet. I have to make sure I exercise and meditate and eat a good diet and healthy things and not sugar. But the moment I go on holiday and relaxed, I can pretty much eat what I want without any ill effects. <laughs> Right now, what is going on there? Once again, it's the idea of the bucket, your capacity yep, to handle that level of stress. And so that's what we want to improve on. Now, there is something that's tangential to your question, which is, I do believe that because we're living in a more toxic environment in terms of our food and pollution, our systems are undergoing what we call a background low grade inflammation. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly in this danger threat response because we're living in a more dangerous environment. So that's putting stuff in the bucket. But more importantly, well, just as importantly, our modern way of living, we are literally breeding people to have anxiety and depression because what we're doing is taking people from essentially agrarian communities or fishing communities, hunter gathering communities, the last hundred years or so, put them in a box, make them stare at a screen for 12 to 14 hours a day, uh, make them sedentary, get them low exposure to daylight and sunlight, make them eat toxic foods, have no exercise, and put them under a huge amount of stress, and finally get them to compare themselves to everybody on the planet through social media. <laughs> yeah. Literally a recipe for bad health. And so that's why we're seeing more and more of these diseases, because our system, our bucket is overstressed, we're overthreatening the system, and then infections and stuff come along and they're the straw that broke the camel's back and then we launch into illness and the system then goes into this hyper defensive state so therefore our patients they know that we want them to get well but we want them to stay well so we then once we got them well 80 90 percent recovery we then work on their stress their parts work their you know we coach them on that to make sure they have a more stress-free life moving on from that Oh boy. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack there in what you just said, because it is, it is how I feel too. I feel like we, we have taken people and created, created illness just by, by the lifestyle. Now I have a question, you know, I think a lot of people might be thinking right now, like, okay, how long is the program? How, how long do people average on average take to kind of start retraining and, and feeling better? Give us a scoop there. So our program is a six month program. And people might think, wow, six months, that's a long commitment. Well, we can say three to six months, but really that's because we don't want people to become complacent. Yeah. So some people use our program and within weeks and months, they're getting better. They're getting up to 80, 90% recovery. For others, it takes longer to see the impact. Because if your brain has been responding in a certain way for months, if not years, I mean, you know, we've all seen clients who've had it for more than a decade, a couple of decades. The brain isn't going to get the message the first time to say, hey, we're safe and everything's rosy, switch off, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to take that repetition and time and re acclimatization to a new way of being. So our patients, you know, and that's actually where the word patient comes from, 
Yeah, because in the olden days, there weren't any treatments. So it was just about being patient. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so therefore, with this program as well, we encourage people to commit to 100%, but let go of the outcome. Because once again, like our bucket, if we keep saying, right, is it working yet? Is it working yet? Like if you have a scar on your hand, you cut yourself and you have a scar. If every day you keep picking at the scar going, are you healed yet? Are you healed yet? We make things worse. So instead, it is about going into our program, using it every day, and then just trusting in the process. That is the number one thing. And of course, we're used to a consumer society where it's where I take a pill and I should be feeling better now. Yep, that is the way we think. And not only that, we think about health in that way as well, but a commitment to do something every day seems like a chore, but really it's an investment in our health because not only do we recover our physical health, but we feel emotionally better when we do these types of exercises. So people commit each day to these exercises, come to the webinars, come to our daily events, but the, the minimum investment is just half an hour a day. And I think that's doable for most of us and then little short exercises throughout the day. We have people working full time who can do, you still you know, use our program. And through that commitment, then over a number of months, people feel the improvements. But people know once they get the improvement, they want to continue with our program because they know if they stop using it for a week, guess what? Some symptoms come back sometimes because the brain is still sensitive. Like once you've trained the brain, it feels safe, but it can still have that sensitivity. So if a stress comes along, a virus comes along, it may think it's under threat again and go back into its old responses. So in some ways, living the Gupta lifestyle is something that we do for the rest of our lives to keep ourselves on top of how our body is responding. And this relates, and Ginny, I'm sure you see this in your clinic, this relates to what we call adverse childhood experiences. So many people who get these types of conditions, there's a, a predetermination, not predetermination, but a predisposing factor, which is childhood trauma, childhood bullying or abuse, that can be a risk factor. So our amygdalas have a factory setting, and that is set by how our mother felt when we were in the womb, to how stressed she was, then the birth experience itself, and then the first five years of life, first five to 10 years, they impact on the factory setting of our amygdala. Then what happens during later life, that determines our levels of sensitivity to the world around us. Not only our emotional sensitivity, but actually our physiological sensitivity, which is why people who've had a background of trauma, they're more prone to then getting these neurological events in the brain, which cause them to over-respond to viruses, bacteria, mold. And that in a nutshell is a simple reason why people are three to four times more likely to have these conditions. Makes sense. It makes sense. So I think a lot of people might be thinking now, like, Shuck, okay, so obviously living the Gupta program life, living the life, what what do you do now to keep things at bay? What are you up to, to kind of, what's your maintenance, I guess, protocol for yourself? I, I'm just curious, and I'm sure other folks might be too. Of course, yeah. And this isn't the maintenance protocol for my clients, because we know that people, when they've got a stressed out nervous system, they wouldn't be able to do this to to this level. So this isn't sure. what I would recommend people doing. But now that I'm completely healed, I wake up in the morning, have a big glass of water, often with alkaline water. So I'll put uh, lemon overnight or cucumber overnight. Then I will do some cardio. So I'll do 20 to 30 minutes of cardio exercise outdoors. So I'm getting the bright light and I'm doing uh, strength training and cardio. Then I'll have a shower and straight after that I will do yoga. Then I will do breathing techniques. I do the breathing techniques from an organization called the Art of Living Foundation. I don't know if you've heard of that, but they're the Art of Living Foundation, their breathing is the top most breathing I've, I've come across and I would really recommend that. Then I do 20 to 30 minutes of meditation. So that whole process is about an hour and a half in the morning. But I know once I've done that in the morning, my capacity increases, my bucket gets bigger and I can feel pressure during the day, I can have lots of meetings, but I'll be absolutely fine because my system and my nervous system has been refined to be calm and centered and relaxed. My capacity has increased. Yeah. And then I'll meditate again in the evening before dinner. And then before sleep, uh, I'll go for a walk to allow my digestion to be better. I'll sleep, you know, I'll go for a walk after dinner. And then uh, before sleep, might do some relaxation uh, as well. So that's my kind of daily process. 
I love to ask people that because it's fun to just hear. And and honestly, most of the most chill people I know have this, you know, a very similar kind of of mm -hmm. routine. And and so I think, you know, for a lot of folks, we're kind of also all searching out like, OK, where can we get ourselves back to calm and safety? And, and obviously that's what you're doing with your program, which is really cool. And I'm just curious because you've got the six months of, of seeing folks. Are there any cases that stand out for you that you're like, whoa, that was really cool? Could you share one with us just to kind of give folks, like bring it all full circle so folks could hear kind of a cool case, just inspire yeah. them? Oh, there's so many, but the one that inspires me the most was there was a guy in New Zealand, and uh, that's the great thing about having an app is we can reach you know everyone in the world. He was in his early 80s, 82, and this is a number of years ago, and imagine, when you're 82 years old, I mean, you don't know what's causing what, right? And then when you're at that age, and he had had fibromyalgia, mold, pain, you name it, he'd had it for 30 years and had a, a low quality of life, was very depressed. And he used our program and over the space of six months, he got gradually better. He got up to 80, 85% healed. And I said to him, what are you going to do now? You know, this is great, but you know, you're in your early eighties now. He said, hey, I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to do all the things that I've always wanted to do in my life, but never had the opportunity to do it. And that inspired me because, you know, we might think in our, by the time we're in our 80s, we, our brain's not neuroplastic anymore. We can't learn new things. And yet that's the great promise of neuroplasticity, that even in your 80s, you can learn a musical instrument, you can learn to dance, and your brain can learn a new way of responding. And that, I think, if he can do it, then anybody on the planet can retrain their brain, they can rewire their brain and get their health back. And that's what is really, you know, inspires me each day. What gets me up every morning mm -hmm. is seeing the amazing stories and transformations that people go through. And then recently, long COVID and, you know, the long COVID stories are so fascinating because we'll get some people, it'll take months and months and months to heal. And some people within 10 days, two weeks, they'll heal because it's not been in there it's not been around for so long right it hasn't embedded itself so deeply in the brain so we had a gentleman that um you know he was a marathon runner he cycled could cycle 100 kilometers in a day and he suddenly was struck down with long covid for a year he was on the couch and he managed to retrain and he got his health back and then he was back to marathon running again and uh, cycling and i just thought wow isn't that amazing that you can just be flat on your back but just through the power of this brain retraining, you can get your system back to ner back to balance and then go on to you know, that physical ability to come back. I think is the contrast was phenomenal. Then we've had people within, yeah, as I said, one or two weeks who've been able to get their health back. But we don't put that expectation in people's minds because the moment you have that, you'll do this and think, hey, why isn't it working? We say, give it at least six months to really see what your brain is ready for and the improvements that you will see. Yeah, I think that's so important with not giving those expectations because like you said before, it's it's the old case of the weight loss program, you know? <laughs> You're like two days later, why haven't I lost 10, 10 pounds? What's going on? Why isn't it happening? It's, it's tough. It's a tough thing. Wow, good stuff here. So let's tell folks how to find you, what, you know, where's the best place to link up with you and learn more and how can they sign up? Sure. And uh, just something I wanted to add was that we can hear about a lot of these different types of treatments and programs yeah. and various things. But what matters to us is the science, because anyone can say, oh, yes, this is going to get you well. But we really focus on the science. So we've conducted many medical trials, which you can see on our website. You can see the full papers and they've been run by independent organizations. And a couple of examples. So we conducted a randomized controlled trial on fibromyalgia. And we found that after just eight weeks of our program, there was a 40% reduction in fibromyalgia scores in the Gupta program, but zero in the control group. And we also halved anxiety, halved depression, et cetera, and halved pain just in eight weeks. Wow. And then a long COVID study that we did a couple of years ago, we compared our program to a wellness program that included diet, supplements, et cetera. And after three months, the Gupta program was four times more effective at reducing fatigue and exhaustion and twice as effective at increasing levels of energy. And that's an independent study that's been published. And we're doing further studies right now. And a recent study we just published, which wasn't a randomized controlled trial, but it was a clinical audit. It found that after three months of using the Gupta program, across 14 different conditions, people improved their health 
from between 60 to 120 percent. Um, and for instance, Lyme disease, there was 116 percent improvement in health after three months. Uh, long COVID, I think it was 84 percent improvement in health. And uh, that was a study across, I think, about three to four hundred patients. So once again, we're seeing that there's an all these different conditions may be out there that there may be one underlying hypothesis as to what causes them. So we really want people to know this is now being more and more science backed and we're doing more and more scientific studies. So if people want to find out more about this, we encourage them to go to our website, which is guptaprogram.com. That's G-U-P-T-A. And on there, they can sign up for the free trial. They can read our medical papers. You can watch, there's over 400 testimonials on there on our success stories page. You can watch lots of videos of people's experience experiences and then you can also just go to the app store or play store and search Gupta program brain retraining and there you can also just download the app as well so there's lots of resources lots of free videos and then if people feel that this is something that's right for them then they can sign up for our full premium program which is a one-year subscription and until we get large-scale phase three trials we offer a one-year money-back guarantee on our treatment which you know is unheard of so you can use our treatment. If it doesn't work for you, we can return it. There's a small payment for postage and packing, but you can return it, get your money back and use that money uh, somewhere else. So people have got nothing to lose by giving this type of approach, uh, you know, a go. And we now are just, especially with the daily Gupta size. I mean, imagine people get that yearly subscription and every day, Monday to Friday, they're having these daily Zoom sessions, which, you know, is unheard of. And we would caution people that there's a lot of programs now where people have either you know, used our program or they've created something, but it doesn't have a science that's backing it up and they're pushing it as a brain retraining program, et cetera. But often we find that a lot of those programs have lost the essence of the compassion behind it, or they become like a boot camp approach. And we were the original program to come up with this and keep looking to improve. And so not all programs are the same. Uh, you know, it really is important to research the right one for you. That's that's wise advice because I have heard from you know I've I've had a couple other folks on on the podcast too and we've talked about different brain retraining. Yours hits on what I've always suspected as the the overactive nervous system combined with the you know the neuroimmune response and so it makes sense to me. It, it's much like what I hypothesized for years and and it makes sense. So I'm excited for you guys to get some more of the research. The phase three trials, so yes, yeah, the, large, yeah. the larger scale trials. Yeah, well, um, it all comes down to funding. And as you know, the way our systems are set up, if you have a pill and you're part of a pharmaceutical company, you can afford to fund this type of thing. And yet in the last 30 years, no pharmaceutical company has come up with any consistent treatment for chronic fatigue or chronic fatigue syndrome. And therefore, more money needs to be channeled into this approach. So we have a 501c3 compliant fund in the US where people can donate money and that money goes purely to non-profit research and we need to raise about half a million dollars actually up to a million dollars to really fund all of these different trials because as you know medical research is extremely expensive yeah. so once we have that funding in place then we can do those larger scale phase two and phase three trials so yes if anyone can support us in that who knows who can fund this uh, then please do let us know because that is our overarching need uh, right now to get this done but i would hope in the next few years i mean my dream is in five to ten years time you go to see your doctor for one of these types of conditions and the first thing they prescribe you is brain retraining imagine that we could catch all of these conditions super early and don't get me wrong we're not dogmatic so we do believe it's useful to combine that with approaches like yourself where we look at the uh, you know, the nutrients, we look at so many other aspects of the lifestyle, etc. So it would be a combined approach. And if we can get that prescribed up front, then that would just be amazing. And we'd relieve so much suffering around the world. Absolutely agree. It's definitely the the way for, for what we would call a true holistic type of approach, for sure. Wow, Asha, good stuff. This is This is definitely fascinating. I want to make sure that folks really can see the your theory. Um, so I'm going to figure out how to get that onto the the podcast so that they can see it all right in front of them, how everything links together, because that was one of the things that I was fascinated by when I was looking at your website. So great stuff here. Keep up the good work. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.
Hey, Health Junkies. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Health Fix podcast. To help support my mission to bring you tips, tricks, and tools to help you optimize your health, I'd be grateful if you'd like, subscribe, and write me a review for the podcast. And if you hear a product you're interested in on the podcast, you can now go over to my website to learn more. That's doctor spelled out, J-K-R-A-U-S-E, nd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find all the information on my favorite products that I stand behind and use myself. All affiliate income earned with your purchases goes directly to help support the production of the podcast so I can keep bringing you quality health information. I appreciate your support and I'm honored to have you listening to my podcast as a fellow health junkie. Thanks again.